And I'd like to call the next panelist to be ready. We have uh, Kiana. I know I saw Kiana here just briefly. Okay, so shall we be right back? <laughs> and we have Lance Foster. And as we know, he's the vice chairman, Iowa tribe of Kansas and Nebraska. Jesse Deer in Water. Please come forward. Jesse is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, director of Citizens Resistance Against Fermi II Craft. And we have the esteemed great grandmother Mary Lyons Ojibwe. Nish Nibi Ikwe, second water woman, elder of Mitiwag, Dewegas, Gishtashkad, Gishtashkad, the water drum circle. So each of our panelists all have their specialties, are all well known in their areas. And uh, great grandmother Mary Lyons also has a video that she wants to have uh, shown. But as we're starting, uh, I'd like for each uh, person to introduce themselves. Or would you prefer to show the video first? Okay, so video first and then uh, introductions.
I want to start with one question here, a question to start this panel today is uh, how each person from your perspective, from your tribe, how you view water according to your belief system and you know, let us know how you live, etc., and what you do. Weave the hunt. First of all, uh, I'm great grandmother Mary Lyons, Kukum. Um, my father was First Nations Ojibwe, my mother was stateside, so it would be Kukum in the northern area of Turtle Island, and uh, below the invisible line would be Nishkomas. Um, I, I don't even like talking about what I've done because we'd be here until you'd have grandchildren, so I'm not going to do that to you. As <clears throat> First of all, I want to say thank you, and I want to say thank you to everyone that put this conference together and all of you in the room here that made time for this because, you know, sometimes if you just have one person hearing the message of how we move forward within the sanctuary of uh, this one element, water, it, it, it will move mountains. Um, the Maori uh, say, I am the river and the river is me, and in Anishinaabe we say the same thing, and I'm sure as many other people around the world that, you know, the elements are in us, they're around us, and we are the oneness. So one of the questions that was brought up, and one of the reasons why I like showing this clip is that when you build a bridge, we can't expect an, another culture to understand our culture. And I was speaking to some young ladies earlier about how we moved the MIMIW bill, you know, coming at it for 32 years, I guess it was and then having to leave the United Nations, have, we were talking about it, coming back to Minnesota, and how did we get the people to really understand of how we put the MMIW bill into motion? And the reason why I bring this up and how I'm gonna relate it to water is gonna be in that same message. So when we were looking at the individuals here of how are we gonna get them to pass this bill, no matter how much we screamed, no matter how much we protest, no matter what we did, right? They were never going to get it. So we were stuck. We were stalemate. Then we had to come to the realization, realization is we had to step back. We had to step back and we had to look at everything as a whole. How do we all relate on one level so we can make sure we can get a lot of the answers answered? And the one thing was they're never going to understand their culture. We're probably never going to understand their culture. Even some within our tribal systems, we're not going to understand each other's cultures. But that doesn't mean we can't respect them, right? Does that make sense? So having this said that, you know, when you're up there talking against on both sides and when you're up, you know, in these buildings, these big concrete buildings that are making decisions for all the people and your grandchildren and your grandchildren after that, is that what is the one thing, what is the one factor you have in common? And that's money. So we had to go on the foolishness of what they spent with on money in order for us to pass that bill. We passed it that day anonymously. There was not one nay. It lit up. That was a victory for us. So understanding that relationship of communication especially when it comes to water. This documentary, this short clip, was filmed in that same sense, you know, because we're going to have many people throughout the globe that are going to argue about, you know, what is their religious rights, their beliefs and practices, and et cetera, on and on. A lot of people don't know that this actual um, song was written within the enslavement down south, you know, within the African Americans. So the history goes on and how it's introduced and how you bring it forward. But it was happened in northern Minnesota that the Chicago, or the Chicago 7, listen to me, Nabisa. Chicago 7, where am I going? I'm going to Chicago next week. <coughs> but the, um, um, the seven grandmothers you see there were arrested um, 
that one particular day and while they were in jail, locked up, facing felony charges and stuff, not knowing if they're ever gonna be getting out, is that they had to come to some agreement of happiness and to share a relationship. And a lot of these songs that is played throughout time, they came up with these wordings and they put it into practice. So it would be universal for many people. Everybody in this room understood this song? Has everybody heard this song before? You know, s yeah, see, I mean, it's universal. It's a, it, and the thing is, when you put words to just that rhythm and that tone in that there, you can get everybody's attention. So what you're doing is it's kind of like, you know, one plate, one people. Does that make sense? So on this water issues that what we move forth and we talk about, is that, you know, I was very fortunate to be down in, in New Zealand when they were tail ending it when I was very young on um, the first practices of, of making the rights of nature with the Wanganui tribes. And one of the grandmothers that I travel with is, is from the Wanganui tribe. And it was really interesting because when you do is you come as a student, walk as a student, and you leave as a student. So it was very, very important because you're listening to the original gardeners of this land, the original caretakers of this land, of why this land and water air is very important to them. And why is it so responsible? Why you have to be responsible? So <clears throat> to indigenous people, it really isn't the rights of nature. Ours is the natural law. Does that make sense? But the interpretation to many people, especially within the United States of America, they don't recognize that or any other government components that go beyond the UN and that there because they have to have these special wordings that can recognize and make them feel comfortable. So we're going to give these rights, these water, tree, air, we're going to give them rights. That's really a privilege. That's something we're going to give them, right? That's that hierarchy power. And you can't even see it's not even a colonialism practice, it's a practice of an entity of a fear power that started tens of thousands of years ago, right? So when you look at the natural, the natural law, you know, you, you, you cannot argue with it, you cannot justify it, you have to befriend it, right? Every one of us. Because we can say we're killing the earth. That, again, if anybody heard me this morning, I, that's grandiose thinking, oh, hogwash, I'll tell everybody. We're not killing the earth. We're killing off what Mother Earth allowed us to have. This earth is going to go on thousands of years from now. We're just not going to be in it. Does that make sense? So that fear factor is saying, you know, oh, yeah, we're doing, you know, we're doing everything. We're killing off you know, the livable air, the water, you can go on and on and on. I don't care how much education people have in here. And listen, I'm going to say this, and you can throw darts at me as I walk out the door. But I tell my grandchildren, and they're educated, that sometimes you pay for an education that is not true. They get you in for thousands and thousands and thousands upon dollars. And this just happened within the last hundred years. Mind you, our ancestors lived for 10,000 years using the organic practice. But it took us less than 150 years to kill that organic practice and to fall into this monkey see, monkey do, okay, I'm going to do and look at me. And listen, I have this letter before me and after. But mind you, I have to say, I'm very proud of what you guys do. But the foolishness is happening and they're realizing it now. As much education as you have, guess what? You're coming back to the knowledge holders. And that's part of the group that I swing and hang with. That's my gang, right? We're getting ready to go to Dubai, all the knowledge holders around the world and this stuff, and they quarantine us and this stuff because these big companies want to come and they want to use some of our wording so they can push some more that we support them. That is not what we're going to be doing because we're moving forth of what is the natural laws and not the rights of nature. We shouldn't have to have a right. We should have to have that organic thinking of it's natural, it's organic. 
And we heard some people talking up here as we talked before. You know, I can go into this whole thing about water from now until I'm blue in the face, right? But what good is it going get, to get each one of us if I'm just spilling information? But one of the things I have to tell you is that this water that we have from the sink and in those bottles has no life in it. It's liquid. And we prostituted that element to serve a better cause and really not us. We have to pay attention because the waters and the streams and the lakes and that there, we should be able to drink from. But we, we destroyed them. Now, pay attention. We destroyed it within the last 150 years, even short if you really look at it scientifically, within the last 75 years because we are not paying attention. And we fell into this greed mole and this whole saying, I need, I want to be lazy, I don't want to do it. There was a time, even when I was little, you put a spigot in the ground, pump the water, drink it, and run and play. There was no water bill. The, one, the reason why we show the one thirst for justice and out there, because if you heard those people, their water bills are more than what their rent is and they can't drink it. Water is a commodity that feeds the trees. The trees are the straws. They suck that water up. They have that relationship. They're relatives because they're coming down that stream and they're thinking, oh gosh, I want to see the elm, I want to see the birch, I want to see the pine, whatever. And they thirst and they pull that up. And in those limbs, they stretch out just like you just did. Didn't that feel good after sitting, talking to listening to all this wonderful, good information that you get to stretch? You get that freedom to do that. Just to these trees and they grow these buds and they do all of this stuff because they have that water source coming into them. Then they grow and they blow and they start cleaning the air and all of this stuff. And they carry the mist, they may have you know, maple in it. They may have the foods in it that's growing on it. We depend on one another. That's relatives. You see, and when they clear cut those trees and out there and that stream is going down or to go say hi to its relations and they're not there, well, they have no reason to go there anymore. So guess what happens? It gets desolate. It dries up because you severed a friendship. Then what has severs a friendship, severs a clean air. It goes on. These four elements. That is the book of knowledge. It's not a word that costs a hundred dollars that you can't even pronounce, I can't even pronounce or say. You know, we created all this, this cosmology and all of this stuff to confuse our young ones. But yet we can still drive down the road and we can see on the thing there, do not swim today. Contaminants. You have to boil your water. Sometimes there's even people that don't even know what the intake that they're taking because that chlorine is so high. You have to start paying attention, and by paying attention, this is not being, okay, I know. You have to start paying attention who is in leadership. Who is really behind this climate action? Who is really protecting the people? We can't keep pointing our fingers and blaming them. We have to be the responsible individuals. Does that make sense? Now, I say this from being a great-grandmother because I love humanity. It's important to me. It's important to me when I walk into a elder's unit where they're kind of thrown away. I, it makes me sad. I'll sit in there and listen to these living libraries and wanting to hear what they remember, no matter what color they are, no matter what denomination they are. They sit and they laugh. But the thing is what they remember, which hardly any of our children will ever remember, is how safe the water was to go in and splash, play around and drink it, and come back. 
That's my age. That's my, who I am. My daughter may have some memories, but my grandchildren don't, nor does my great-granddaughter now, because the first thing we have to do is we have to check how safe the water is today, how safe the air is today. We have to have limitations of what we do for practice. So the only thing we can teach them is this is the knowledge of your ancestors. If you can teach one of your friends that's non-indigenous this way and they understand it, then you did your job, your, your lifetime job. Because every person that's born in this world, they're leader of nations. So if you know it and you practice it, you've just started a flood of wellness. Does that make sense? So this young lady had a bunch of questions and I said, I probably am not gonna be able to answer them that way because I, I think in a global mind. One of the things I really like to push forward no matter what platform I'm at is that those four elements shows no prejudice. That water doesn't say I'm just for these indigenous people or for this group or for that group. It shows no prejudice. We need the water, we need the air, we need the fire, and we all are the oneness. We all live on this planet we call home, Mother Earth. Does that make sense? So when you're thinking and you're moving forward, especially when it comes to water issues, please, please don't make it an indigenous issue. Please don't make it a black issue. Please don't make it. This issue is a human issue. Because that water flows and it has relatives all over. And if you really want to know about the critical part of water these days, is talk to the waterworks. This is sad. This is one of the most saddest things you'll ever, ever hear is when we were in Chicago and they talked about the waterworks and people came in out there. They have high rate of suicide because one little tap can change a whole environment in a community if they put too much something within that water that has to go to a school, hospital, or whatever. And there's being mistakes being made every day. We used to think it was some of the people that were, what are they called? When they control the airplanes? Traffic control, right? Was another big one. See, I always go and I always make sure I celebrate who, who is really behind keeping us safe. You really have to think about it, right? And the waterworks in that there. I always say, sing, sing them praise. You know, yeah, it's nice to have a fireman and, and a policeman and this stuff. Oh, heck yeah, I still celebrate them too, but when it comes down to it, it's a waterwork for me all the way every day because they really have a difficult job. They really have some high responsibilities. So make sure when you're out there, when you're giving all these praises to people that are gonna keep the wellness of who we are, think beyond what we think we know. Sit with another and just listen as a student because you'll learn something. So that's what I have to say, and um, I wanna say chi mi gut. It was, I'm so happy I came because I listened to a lot of people. And I can say, this old lady's happy because I'm looking at a room full of really awesome people that are paying attention. Miigwech. Oh, yeah, great grandmother. Um, yat e shik es do shitane e do shik e my friends, my people, my relatives. She e kiana kale kini yanishia ashihe nishle totsotni da shiche um shija do shinala e kanaka maoli. Um, my name is Kiana Clay Kini, and this is how I introduce myself as a Diné woman. But um, as you may have seen in the agenda, I am also Native Hawaiian. I did grow up um, on Diné Pikeyat in Arizona on the Navajo Reservation. And I won't go too much 
into my background just for essence of time and my bios also in the packet. Um, but I do have a background in um, public health and uh, community service and uh, water justice for our people. And so I just wanna go right into the question that Renee had asked about how our people um, view water. And you know, I'm really honored to be sitting here with all of you and on this panel today to really talk on behalf of water and how our people um, have a connection with water. And uh, I think one of the most heartbreaking realities of our society right now is that water is treated um, really only as a resource, something to be exploited and used. And um, there's really no reciprocity or coexistence that, um, and like an understanding that protecting Mother Earth um, in turn nourishes us. And so, so many things are cyclical in this universe um, and in our Diné teachings and way of life. We live in this way. Um, my Shana Carlos had talked a little bit about um, sort of this orbit around the sun and um, that's pretty inherent in sort of this model of way of life that we live. It's called um, Shabik Echo, that's A Odath, which is um, a journey of wellness uh, guided by the journey of the sun. And uh, in this uh, journey and in this cycle, um, a really core fundamental law of this um, and of our people, it believes that water is one of the four sacred elements and was put forth to us by our Dien Dene'e, our holy people, and uh, Nahat's An, which is Mother Earth, um, really as a source of life. And um, in the Dene way, we see water um, as alive, and you know we treat it as such, um, or <laughs> at least we should be treating it as such as a living being. And um, all, all human life and all life on Earth um, you know, has a degree of water in their systems. And in our culture, we have a really deep connection to it. You know, we feel it, that connection deep in our bones and understand the reciprocal relationship to water. Um, for our people that water is the giver of life and, um, and it's also the gift of life from Nahat's An. Um, so in our people, you know, we take the offering and in turn we respect it and we admire it and thank it and then we must take care of it. Um, in the documentary you saw yesterday and something you may have been hearing increasingly since um, uh, our relatives at um, No Dapple, Tohe Ina Ateh, which is water is life. Um, and I like to say Tohe Ina Do Tohe Ina Ni Ateh, which is water is life and water is alive. Uh, can y'all hear me? Yeah. It's pretty decent. Uh, so the question was uh, importance of water to myself or my people or my community. Uh, so, Jesse, uh, just saying I'm here. My name is Jesse Deer in Water. I'm glad to be present. Thankful for everyone to be here and hope you're all doing decent. So, uh, so, so yeah. Uh, uh, I come from a small Cherokee community, uh, actually Anigaduagi, uh, because uh, I can't speak towards all Cherokees because uh, there's lots of different points of views nowadays. Nowadays, but uh, I was born in a small community and uh, uh, pretty traditional for the most sense. We got one of, the, one of some of the last ceremonial grounds within a few miles in different directions, and uh, 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 to our people, you know, this this earth here was a ball of water. Uh, a beetle went down and pulled up a bunch of dirt, brought it up, a buzzard dried it out. So water's always been of importance here on this planet 
and that's how we were taught. And it's like one of the sources, you know, they say, uh, uh, wind and water, breath and blood. That's, uh, that's like, uh, two, like the key things that moves all things on the earth and, uh, uh, here. And so we're supposed to be able to respect it. And also that that water was like a reflection of the sky and the stars in the upper world and, uh, below it, uh, also contains elements of that. They're a little more chaotic than up there, but, uh, 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 but it's still that. And so like we had lots of different uh, purification ceremonies. Uh, whenever you wanted to do medicine, good medicine, break bad medicine, different things like that, water was key. It was always key, direction of its flow, uh, how clean it is, this, that, and the other. Uh, and so like I was kind of raised that like uh, uh, protecting springs and protecting water uh, and uh, just from harm, like whether it be local people dumping stuff in it or it be like corporations dumping stuff in it, that's still uh, uh, desecrating the water, especially spring water, because it's that important to us. And so uh, uh, there was a uranium processing plant in our community uh, called the Kermagee facility. Uh, it's actually kind of a famous story because this woman was like uh, mysteriously died who was a whistleblower, her name was Karen Silkwood. And, uh, uh, and that kind of like, the local folks knew about it because it was just all like uh, Katua's Cherokee or Katua's Cherokees, Choctaws and Seminoles and Creeks that worked there. Uh, most, most of them handling uh, waste in different capacities. Uh, but folks began to recognize that they were doing something with these ponds and these local waterways uh, and that the water was changing uh, through about like five or six years and that the land was kind of dying. And that was like one of the first signs that, you know, the animals stopped going to that area, plants are dying, uh, 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 the waterway just begins to look different. There's just an essence about it that just feels sick. Like if you've ever been to a city or a poisoned waterway, you can see sometimes there's trees growing in those areas, but there's this essence in the water. It just feels like sickness, you know? And uh, so, so people begin to recognize that. And so the community came together and formed Native Americans for a Clean Environment, NACE, uh, uh, my mom was one of the leaders in that, and that's kind of how I got introduced to uh, environmental justice and stuff like that, uh, and the nuclear abolition work. So uh, they fought back, you know, and uh, it didn't get the place closed, but it led to that, like, uh, eventually all that stuff that was raised kind of led to uh, the place getting shut down. There's no way to clean it up. It's now a super fun site, and so we have a super fun site uh, within, like, four miles of one ceremonial grounds and like uh, eight, eight uh, miles from another ceremonial grounds uh, goes against, it goes against a lot. And so that's just an introduction. We're kind of actually ran out of that town, uh, death threats, the Ku Klux Klan, blah, 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 stuff like that on mom. And so we came left and went to Michigan. So this kind of brings me to where I'm at now. So uh, some of the work I do and some of the thing I'm about to speak from is uh, uh, also from an urban Indian perspective. So I've been in Michigan now for like seven years in Detroit. Uh, shout out to the folks that did work in Detroit and have some knowledge of what's going on there because it is, uh, 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 it's a water, it's a fight for the water there because you have uh, all the folks trying to capitalize on it from uh, the uh, different corporations and the power plants that are using, you know, just, just for instance, the reactor that we're working to uh, see shut down, decommission and replace with different kinds of cleaner energy sources that people have the say and control over. Uh, that plant uses 45 million gallons of water a day from the creek, from a creek to, uh, 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 for its cooling processes and then dilutes it at 10 to one uh, with the waste treatment and waste and pollutants and the radioactive elements that are in it. And it puts out that 45 million gallons back out. And so it's 4.5 million gallons of waste that goes out into the water every day. And uh, that's sick, man, that's sick. And Lake Erie is uh, uh, one of the lakes that's uh, in the Great Lakes. Some people say it's the grandmother Great Lake because it's one of the older ones. And uh, 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 just, how dare us disrespect our grandmothers like that? You know what I mean? It, 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 it's messed up. And so uh, uh, that's one of the things that, uh, that I'm doing. And I kind of taken uh, the, a leadership role in uh, one of the groups, a really grassroots resistance group uh, 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 that's kind of been indigenous led, but never 
it was never like in the forefront, you know, it was just the people behind the scenes doing that. And then it was like, the, you know, the privileged white people showing up in the courts, you know what I mean, or whatever, to speak on our behalf. But uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a different perspective to look at water like we have to have a relationship with it, like it's not a commodity, like it's not there for our enjoyment, uh, uh, for us to do whatever we, we want with. Uh, uh, people weren't looking. People weren't looking at it like there was a relationship. Like, uh, uh, like you said, this earth and these waters, uh, though there may be a sickness in there that's polluting the beings and stuff like that, it could still be here for a long time after us and be doing be doing their thing. And so uh, we weren't getting any, we, we weren't having any uh, uh, luck or any kind of momentum or anything just, just relying on legal systems and this, that, and the other. And so uh, I wanted to change the, uh, the narrative, change the way that like, like we look at it, uh, we look at our relationship to the water. We're not there saving it uh, uh, we're not there saving it so that we can go boat and fish and swim and this, that, and the other. Uh, it's a relationship. It's a responsibility. You know, those, those waters have, uh, they, they have fish, you know, uh, does a, does a fish have a right to live? Does a fish have a right to lay eggs? Does a fish egg have a right to grow up and be eaten by a bear or a human or clean the waters? No, they do it like that natural law. That uh, uh, and 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 that's a responsibility that they have in the relationship with like the universe or all of creation or however you want to say it, you know. Uh, uh, and so we had to kind of like look at it different or whatever it is. Uh, uh, and, and I wanted people to look at it different because uh, it wasn't being seen like that. It, it was just being seen that like that that human supremacy. Uh, that you know we're the ones we're this we're that we're the other and uh uh i this might be kind of weird y'all but i was like doing this fast and uh, uh with these other folks and uh we started talking about like uh like we kind of just went into like a little dream state kind of and uh uh we did these we did this thing of like i don't know the pathway forward you know what i mean the relationship with the water what it looks like to get people and uh, I was one of the people that seen these different colored spirits coming out of the water, uh, uh, and, and they all represented something different. Like, I don't know if it was something that lives in the water or uh, something that comes through the water or whatever it is, but uh, whenever, whenever it came up uh, like that, it was like something coming out of the water, and then there was people rushing towards the water, but they weren't running, they weren't mad, they weren't angry. It almost reminded me of a stomp dance. I don't know if anybody's ever seen a stomp dance where people are just like really going for it, you know? And that's what it reminded me, people were dancing towards the water. And, uh, but it wasn't just natives, it wasn't just indigenous people, it was all people, it was all, all cultures uh, 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 within the occupation there in Michigan. Uh, and. That, and I, I shared that with some folks that, that were there in the thing, and uh, they had similar things too. Like, like one woman said she was standing there looking out into the, uh, uh, in, into the water. Uh, this is in her dream, you know, her dream state vision. <laughs> her, yeah, yeah, and uh, she was looking out at, at the water, and uh, she said she could hear what sounded like a million footsteps coming towards the water behind her or whatever it was. And then another woman had said that uh, there was people that danced to the water and this, that, and the other. But all, but all the things that we all had in common uh, with these different visions and these different things were that we had a relationship with the water. Uh, 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 we, we, we went to it. We, uh, we said, please accept our offering of help. You know, please accept our offering to try to step forward and speak on your behalf or uh, step up for you or show up in a... Uh, uh, a court of law or legislative or rally or organize a campaign or, or, or whatever it is. Those are the first steps. We'd have to go back to the waters and we'd have to do our things. And uh, some of the waters that we're protecting there in like Detroit, we're not protecting, uh, 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 we're trying to be in good relationship with uh, there in Detroit and in Southeast Michigan uh, are so polluted that you can't go in them. Uh, the Rouge River is just like a mile from my house, and uh, traditionally, the way I was raised, uh, uh, like I said, I don't speak on behalf of all Cherokees, but or, uh, 
uh, Jalagi or Katua or whatever. I just speak on behalf of my community. And the way I was raised was that uh, you go to water for like everything. I kind of mentioned that before. I can't go to that water there. Uh, it sucks. It sucks really bad. Uh, yeah, and 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 so uh, uh, one of the things as uh, humans uh, that I learned too is that we're the youngest, most ignorant, and that we learned like everything from how to weave baskets, uh, how to do clay pots, uh, how to do controlled burns, uh, how to do all these different things. We learned that from the beings and the elements. Uh, they taught us that. We're 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 dumb. We didn't know nothing. You know what I mean? And uh, so how dare us think that uh, uh, we're bringing nature or water up to our level by giving it rights? Because the rights are human things, you know. Uh, 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 we're out of balance with we're out of balance whenever another human has to have rights to start with, and we're way out of balance whenever uh, water or something like that has to have rights. They should be able to uh, responsibly uh, be in relationship. You know, they have a responsibility to be in this relationship, like the fish in the water, like uh, humans and plants, like the uh, birds and seeds, you know, uh, lots of things like that. that that's a responsibility uh, and relationship in nature and the universe that keeps things going and keeps things in balance. So when we think about rights of nature and rights of water, it's it's within the wordings of it. Like, like you said, it's a, 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 the... The concept of rights, yeah, we can speak towards it, but we're going to have to, uh, uh, if you want to get any kind of uh, laws or anything like that passed or get anything enforced, it's going to be a challenge because, uh, uh, yeah, speaking towards the ecosystem might be more of a better thing. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and close it up here real quick. But uh, uh, speaking towards the ecosystems might might be a better way uh and then also, you're also going to have to think about if you try to move forward with any kind of rights of nature or responsibility thing. And, and this comes from my last two years of speaking with different native communities in my own communities about rights of nature, trying to get the homeland uh, input on it before I, before I went and tried to make some kind of move with some folks, you know, to get some sort of ordinance or something like that. So this is also informed by a lot of Anishinaabek folks in Michigan and leaders there. And so... Uh, 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 also, uh, if you do that, you have to name what the things are that you're kind of protecting it, it, it from. L l like a waterway has a right for all of its things to be in responsible relationship without being polluted, uh, uh, without thermal pollution, uh, without dumping of this, that, and the other. And then if you're able, ever able to enforce that, you'll probably end up in a court of law. And if there's ever been any damages done, they'll want to give you monetary compensation, which totally uh, uh, is like... Uh, uh, reverse the purpose of uh, uh, giving the, the nature rights because the rights is to prevent this stuff from happening. Uh, the rights is to prevent these fools from doing this different stuff. And, 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 and the rights are the rights to clean up and have it be how the people in the community uh, feel like it should be. And so there's always going to be challenges there. And we might not even always be here, certain Indian people or certain communities. I mean, I would like to say that we will be, but there's always the chances that they're not. So many have melted away like snowballs before the sun. And that's a possible continuation to happen. And so uh, uh, we may not always be there to be responsible for it. And uh, uh, so when it comes to rights of nature and rights of water, I just... Uh, I was actually going to pose these as questions to people, depending to the crowd and to, for everyone to think about, because I know that this is a thing that a lot of people are pursuing, and uh, uh, so, yeah, that that's it. I'll pass it on. Yeah. Take, take this down. <laughs> on now. All right, well, I guess I'll hold it like uh, a Las Vegas singer. <laughs> uh, so uh, the question was really about our people, how we see water, and my experiences with that a little bit. Oh, so our word for water is ni. Ni, which is also our word for breath. It is uh, the same thing. We are water. Our relationship to water, we can't get away from it because we are water. It's like our relationship to Earth. People want to go to some other planet, 
you're going to take earth with you because you are earth. You're earth and you're water and you're whole thing. So uh, my people, the Bakhwaje, the Iowa people, uh, we were the, we the people between the two rivers. Uh, Nishoje, that was the Missouri River, the Smoky River, and uh, Nitara, that was the Great River, the Mississippi River. And uh, you can, the shirt I have on here is, uh, I've been involved with uh, the Mississippi River uh, Summit trying to get, uh, recognize those rights. Um, my tribe, the Iowa people, we passed a resolution in 2021 recognizing the rights of the Missouri River. Um, and we know that some of the other nations on the river are thinking about the same thing. Does it mean a lot? Does it have a force of law? Well, as we know as Native people, um, it's about what's right and witnessing what's right, whatever happens, no matter what, no matter what, whatever happens. So uh, and my, one of my mentors, uh, Henrietta Mann, she, uh, when I was an undergrad in the University of Montana, she said sometimes all you can do is be a proper witness and see the truth and carry the truth on and uh, hopefully it turns into something good, um, but you can't be deluded, you can't give up. So I, uh, my people were scattered. We, during allotment, we lost most of our reservations. So my grandma and grandpa went out to California, worked in the um, shipyards in World War II. So part of that diaspora, the tribal diaspora. And um, my dad took us up to Montana when I was five. And so I was raised mainly around the Cheyenne, Blackfeet, those folks up that way. On the other side of the Missouri River. And uh, it was a very different river up there. Very different, especially since I was a kid in the 60s and 70s. And we used to uh, swim in the river and catch trout, and the river was clear, and you could see the rocks on the bottom of the river. And um, it was uh, icy cold. You put your Shasta root beer in there and cool it down when you're camping. Um, but there were beings in the river, too. Well, there were people that got disappeared because you could t see the things there that dragged them down. And our people talk about those beings, you know. Um, that other side of the world, that gateway to another place, and some of our clans came out of that water too. And uh, some came from above, some came from the water, some came from the land, taking their way upward. In our in our time, Madadani, the other time before when humans and animals could talk. So uh, I'll tell you a little story that happened to me when I was in my teens. My family was um, in one of those rafts, you know, and they're rowing down the river up there by Great Falls, between Great Falls and Helena. I was raised in Helena, and um, I was getting towed behind my little sister's uh, little raft thing because there really wasn't enough room for everybody in the raft, so I'm getting towed by the rope. And we're coming down, and all of a sudden I get caught by a whirlpool, and um, it's starting to suck me down, and I start kind of swimming with the whirlpool the way they tell you to. And um, my sister, my sister was about four years old at the time. She was really looking into the water, just staring. And then uh, I was able to kick my way out of it, and then finally get up on the raft. I was very tired. And she, la she told us uh, a little bit later, she said, all those people in the water, they were trying to get your legs. She saw them down there, trying to grab at your legs. And so uh, I know I, I've encountered a lot of things like that through my life. I know a lot of us have. So it's real. It is real. And that's why, even though I'm horrified at what's happening to the world, I'm horrified at it. And I know it's weird. It's like, Human beings, we're part of this, this world, we're like a cell. And this cell that outgrew its proper position and its proper relationship to the other cells and what you call that kind of a cell, you call it a cancer. And I don't like to think of us human beings as that way, but we're not supposed to be that way, but we've grown past that point of what we are. And uh, what happens to them? Basically, cancer is something, treats it, intervention, that cancer regresses for some mysterious reason and withdraws or it ends everything. I don't want to think about the things as I was growing up as a kid, all those movies like Soylent Green and all that stuff, but it sure seems some days that it feels like that and nobody wants to be a, do a downer on this stuff. But I'm more important about seeing the truth rather than being a downer or false cheer either. So I think, I do think, because I've seen those beings in the water and the ones in the clouds and everything, that it's not gonna go that far. We may have to be readjusted. Maybe a lot of us will go away, you know, and be reabsorbed into the great world. But I fully believe, because there is something beyond us, I think it will readjust. And uh, I, I just, 
my hope. Now, what's hope? We all live in hope. But it seems like false hope sometimes. So I think, you know, it's coded in us, right? All our ancestors, wherever we came from. Maybe they were separated from their people and they were looking for them and they're going over one mountain and over the other trying to find their people and they're getting weaker and weaker because they can't get food. But it's that thing in us. We can't escape hope, even, even if it's delusional sometimes because we will keep going because we have to l live. And li life is in us just like water is in us and life will live. Life will live. Water is life. Life is our breath. Water is our breath. It's all connected. And so uh, I'll just kind of leave it there with a couple words. Like everybody knows, Nebraska is, um, a lot of our peoples have the same word, the, the Platte River, basically. Um, Iowa's and the Otos and Missouri's and all the, the Missouri people are part of our people too. So, and then the Mississippi, you know. So I'll just leave it there because I know there's other questions and other folks to talk, but let me just say, I have a complicated message because I feel very complicated about it. And, uh, but I do think there's something beyond us and I, I'm, I'm confident that as we're part of the, all creation, creation will help us adjust to whatever we're gonna have to deal with. And um, I'll leave it there. We uh, for all your comments. Uh, I want to ask this question, uh, and of course, uh, each one of you can answer however you uh, decide to. Uh, how has colonialism affected your access and relationships to water in each of your respective areas? How has colonialism affected your access and relationships to water? <laughs> humor in it <laughs> give me that mic because <laughs> I'm the old lady in the bunch here right? <laughs> you know <clears throat> when I read this from uh, my granddaughter because she listens right I, I have to read you her thoughts because your ancestors lived out of their ancestral memory and not out of European inflicted intelligence. So many today are getting their memory and intelligence mixed up. So your intelligence has to be free from memory. That means you are free from your modern day self. And she goes, that's all. She was 10 years old when she wrote that because she sat well, she was actually born into the, I guess all my kids were born into these movements if they hang with me, right? And so they listen to a lot of their kookums, uncles, grandmothers, everybody, they sit around. <clears throat> but that can pretty much go everywhere. But one of the short lessons I would like to share with you is in order to become the oneness and to work together within unity, sometimes we have to set down some of the things that hold us back, right? And the same little one that she'll be coming to get me in that door any minute now. She was in that film last night. She was in Stanley. She's everywhere, I thought, little one. That's my great granddaughter. She's my pride and joy. But one day, I don't know what it was. When I grew up, when I was little, my father and my grandfather and my elders, we never talked color about people. We never said, oh, here comes this white person, or here comes that old dirty Indian kid over there coming over. They never <laughs> talk like that at home. They just said, oh, someone's coming. Why don't you see what we got to eat for them? It was being a good relative. They didn't care what color or who you are. They just knew there must have been a reason why they were walking towards you, right? So how that colonial impact happens, and you know, <clears throat> working with a lot of legal people on this water issues, we have to be very careful in the, the atonement or the words or however we want to glamorize this when we put it into a piece of paper when we're at the UN or no matter where we're at, right? So when you talk about certain things, you have to identify the source 
One day I got really upset. I was over at the capital of Minnesota and we were debating on something and out there. And there was one person that really just irritated me. So when I came home, I came home and this is what came out of my mouth. And please forgive me for, for what I'm about to say, right? Because it was so wrong in every, every ounce of energy of the word I said. I said, that darn white woman, oh, she made me so mad today. And it wasn't really the words, white woman. It was the energy I carried behind those words. Now, the reason why I tell you this is because if we're looking out for the next seven generations, our next seven generations aren't just of one race. My great-granddaughter looked up at me and she was upset. I said, oh my gosh, my girl, what's the matter? What's happening? She says, Kukum, you only live part of me? Broke me. Because we say celebrate your ancestors. And I just insulted part of her ancestors because she's part Swedish. She's got African-American in her. She's Swedish and she's got four tribes in her. She's Dakota, Lakota Cree, and Anishinaabe. So we have to be extremely careful how we own the separatism of whose rights is right. Does that make sense? Because every single one of you ha are gonna have an offspring that brings a universal language back to the table that we sit and share this food with one another. And that's why we have to say on those seven teachings of love, we have to know that meaning of love. And I will always, people always say, we're talking about an indigenous thing. Well, I'm, we need to talk beyond an indigenous thing because the poison just isn't in the indigenous lands. This poison is everywhere. And we all had our hand in that bucket of pouring it in the water. We all have to be responsible for this. Does that make sense? See, in order to get well, we have to stop pointing fingers. We have to start taking accountability. And the thing is, if somebody wants to put under the rights of nature, and we all agree with it, then that gives that hierarchy the right to do whatever they want because we won't exercise those rights because we've passed it. Somebody else will have the rights to do it. But if we look at that legal sense of the natural law and the order of it is, we all have our hand in it. So that's why I say people, be careful who you sit with, who you talk with, and how you move about. This young man over here is a chef. I listened to him gave good education and what he said is true not just for the indigenous people but for all people on this planet. We were convinced we had to have three meals a day and with snacks in between, mind you. And right now, I might be a little hangry right now. <laughs> because my body is so programmed to this, right? Gotta have my treats. And my grandkids will say to me, Kokum, is that why you don't wear your teeth? Your teeth got rotten because of your treats? No, it's because I got in a car accident and it just knocked my teeth off. But I choose not to because I know what's in dentures and I know what's in the material. I know what's in the hearing aids. And I know within glasses in the morning I get up because I have to exercise because this body is a vessel that carries water. You have to lubricate your eyes I get up, I walk around, I, you know, I may run into a wall or stub my toe or whatever it is, but I don't wear my glasses because I'm tired of it. Every year going to the eye doctor and they're telling me my eyes are bad. But did you know that's a selling, that's a marketing technique? How many people back 150 years ago in this stuff, do you think all our people wear as many glasses as we wear today? Heck no. So do you see how easy we buy into it? Do you know we need to have some water lubrication to get our eyes all moisture and stuff again? No, it isn't. Just hit yourself in the head or think of somebody sad. Start crying. My goodness. What we say when you want to talk about water, you need to be real. You can't glamorize and make it all beautiful and what's happening and this stuff, which it is. But you've got to remember, and if anybody has ever heard 
part of the creation story. There's beautiful creation stories all over. My particular has to be the most beautiful. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I have had to say that with humor to see, you know, maybe I'll get an empty cup hit at me, which is okay. I need to be woken up. But you see, we had this original agreement with Creator that we'd come as a student and we entered the wombs of our mothers while she built this beautiful body. We swam in her oceans, this water, downloaded with memory. Right? Our ancestors are all in us. They're all around us. So when you need to cry, cry, because this is what was told to me from my ancestors. Your spirit is healthy, and you may feel some disappointments in this world, but we're always with you. This body's a plant. So when you cry, that's us hugging you and nourishing this plant so you'll continue. So we rewater our plant by doing that. Does that make sense? Simplest things, and when you talk to children, they get it right away. So I say to a lot of the elders and this stuff, wake that little child up in you, doggone it, and start listening to me or I'm going to hit you on the head. You know? You have to bring that happiness out. You can't always be serious. You guys ain't going to save this planet. I hate to inform you of that. But you can be a part of trying to make it better. Does that make sense? And the other thing that I want to say, and the reason why I'm talking really fast, because i got to go here pretty soon, is that be kind to one another. Stop being prejudiced. Prejudice is a protection weight that only keeps you down out of fear. And so with this water, this water is like every ancestor that walked on this earth is giving each one of us a big hug to say we are all important. <laughs> right? So now on, I see a lot of them, they do. Bring your own container. Stop taking these plastics. People coming in, I like the jug of juice they have back there. Do what you can do. The littlest things is what is going to change this planet because when you put a chokehold on the hierarchy that depends on this money, they're going to start listening. They're going to start listening. The other thing, too, is what they did is they changed within the water in the beginning. My gosh, I mean, I had the crap beat out of me. I was one of these kids that was stolen from boarding school and stuff and had that Bible beaten into me. I learned, uh, my father said, you learned everything you possibly can and get around them. People think I'm just a dumb old Indian woman. Well, I'm not. I can talk a lot of you inside and out. I can talk reality you inside and out. But the fact is that's not my job to do it. My job is to make sure that we push each one of your empowerment buttons within you because you know everything we know. And there's going to be something you're going to share with one another and we're going to learn from one another because that's what being a good relative is. Does that make sense? It's important that we always include the audience in when we speak. And if one of you is asleep, I'm going to walk over and pour water on you. I'm kidding. But see, the whole thing is, when you start moving your body and doing what you're doing in out there, this is the vessel is the first water. You're the first water carrier. You start moving it around and you get in these motions and you're sharing things. It's just not about that river out there and putting it in a cup and drinking it. You have a relationship. You're, those are your relatives. If you have an extra water bottle or, 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 or cup or whatever it is, if you're picking up plastic and there's water in there, don't just throw it down the sink over and put it on the grass, put it on the tree somewhere, and then deposit that God forbidden plastic bottle in where it says you're supposed to recycle, which we know it isn't recyclable. And that's a whole other different story that we're working on on here. 
So when we talk about it, we have to take steps within our own doing. We have to start being responsible. Do one small thing. Teach that one small thing to another person. You know, when you're boiling potatoes, you don't take that boiling water and throw it down the sink. There's a lot of nutrients in it, right? You let that cool off and you go put it on a plant. You're putting in all those nutrients. You could even drink that water. My father used to say, that's healthy, drink it. Carrots, if they, if they weren't cooking them on the fire and the stuff and it happened to be watering out there, we would drink that. So you have to think what you think about food, water, plants. You have to come back to reality. If you took all of this away, oh my God, God forbid if they turn the air conditioner off and it's 107 degrees out, right? What would we do? The water would remind us of how hot it is because every one of you would be soaking wet from sweating. So find your relationship. Because the thing is, also within that relationship, you're going to have to identify and you're going to have to start taking and picking yourself apart and taking those grandiose thoughts away. I'm almost ready for food. Oh my God, I'm always hungry here too. Jeez, <laughs> it's such good food. So anyways, this is my final what I want to say. Because I know each one of you, inside you, has the answer to a lot of these questions. You just have to exercise them. You have to make that right your own. You have to be the person, the motivated person, that starts creating a safer space. And the other thing too is if you want good leadership and if you're that passionate about it, start running for office. Kimmy Good. She mentioned something uh, about separatism that I think is really important. You know, in this question that asks like how colonialism has influenced you know our ways of life and um, the way that we connect with water. And um, you know, when we think about that, it's almost like we are pitting you know a group of people against ourselves. And um, uh, as we all strive to try to heal and make Mother Earth a better place as a collective, as a world, you know, um, sort of being in opposition to each other and our ways of life um, kind of seems counterproductive. I know there's a lot of settings uh, where it's indigenous only and indigenous only practices and that, you know, that to some extent I, I agree with a lot of that. Um, but then I feel like there are opportunities, you know, in, in spaces like this as well, where, you know, we can share our wisdom and knowledge so we can combine all of our ways of life together to um, try to heal Mother Earth. Um, but, you know, in, in thinking about colonialism, though, and trying to work as a, as a collective, you know, not just as indigenous peoples, but like a person of the world, it still really is important to know that um, at the root of inadequate access to clean water lies just a gen genocidal atrocities by way of predatory resource extraction, um, natural resource theft, um, like for our people, massacres and systemic destructions of our foodways and waterways. Um, and, you know, this has really cost just a really devastating loss of land um, and agriculture and water rights for our people on uh, Diné Piquet and, um, and really has prevented our rights as a people um, for access to, to water. And, you know, this is not including any of the acute and chronic health effects, which is just like a totally other <laughs> discussion to be had. Um, and, uh, you know, as a, as a result of all of this, it's really caused sort of a twofold issue for our nation, like one of water scarcity and one of water toxicity. Um, and, you know, as 
the the world as a collective you know there's just so many different types of solutions that we're working towards you know to healing um the the land and the water you know carbon capture preservation and uh, um, conservation and you know ev everyone is well, it's kind of discordant not a lot of people are working collectively but um i did want to bring up this really really cool book that i came across recently um, by Dr. Jessica Hernandez. Um, it's called Fresh Banana Leaves. I'd highly recommend it if uh, anyone wants to look it up, but there's a chapter in there that um, shows really actually how Western conservationism has uh, really harmed indigenous peoples. And um, in Western conservationism, it really, I think, focuses on uh, sort of rooting out invasive species and, and conservationism in, in that sense that includes indigenous peoples. And that approach to me um, really fails to understand that indigenous peoples, um, you know, the, were the original stewards of this land and as great grandmother said, did it successfully for time immemorial um, that uh, we are integral parts of the landscape. And um, when uh, that colonial conservationism, um, you know, one of its biggest failures is to address that. Um, and in, in, that, in that type of solution and um, the atrocities, you know, that we've faced and had stolen from us, uh, a lot of that, as I said, is historical, but today um, in uh, politicizing, I guess, our rights to water and water itself and withholding water rights and access to our ancestral lands is a continuous act of 21st century genocide. Um, there, there really is no life without water. Just like how uh, settler colonialism, colonialism in general, has impacted our access to water, uh, I'm sure a lot of our stories and communities are similar uh, uh, with lack of access due to land uh, or lack of proper access due to safety of the water. Uh, I, I was actually out in Diné Ta in Pueblo land last year and learned a lot about what's going on there. I'm, I'm definitely a student of learning, especially from communities and people that are, you know, been impacted in doing the work. Uh, but like uh, in Michigan, there in Detroit, uh, uh, I'll give the urban aspect, I guess, of how uh, colonialism has impacted the access to water, safe water even, is, uh, so, so when they're building the cities, uh, it was a bunch of wetlands there, and there was tons of rivers and tons of creeks and waterways. And so they uh, uh, filled in the wetlands and they uh, filled in some of the waterways, not all of them, uh, and left some, I, I, I guess they left some, so, so it's like, uh, well, let me rewind a little bit. Uh, so the Anishinaabek Three Fires uh, folks uh, lived in Wawiyamtanong, which is, uh, that's, that's what they call the, uh, 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 where the curved shores meet. Something like that. And that's that Detroit area in between. Uh, it's like the Detroit River from like when it goes to Lake Huron down into Lake Erie. And uh, uh, so an ethnic cleansing and a genocide had to happen for all those people, for most of those folks to be removed. I know a lot of the Potawatomis were removed to the west into different parts and states. You know, Dollar pushed up, some Ojibwe folks, you know, and they ended up over in Canada. You know, different, different stories. Uh, uh, but, but that just paved the way. Uh, for settlers and stolen African bodies to come, you know what I mean, with the, uh, as slaves. And uh, so the story of uh, access to water and how it all happened is really uh, thick and intense there in Michigan, uh, especially in the Detroit area. Uh, but there's been a lot of like uh, liberatory fights 
for people fighting to uh, uh, to have access to to waters, but it's really messed up because it's a lot of uh, private land ownership, corporate land ownership, uh, power company ownership on the lands near the waters. So there's fewer access points for people to be able to have access to water. And I, I, I know we like to talk about everybody getting along and respecting each other, but racism is heavy in Michigan, heavy in Detroit, in the Detroit area. Black people, Arabic people, Latin people, and Indian people can't really, or not Latin, but uh, you know what I mean, uh, our indigenous brothers and sisters from the South, my bad, uh, uh, can't even go to some of these, uh, some of the places where there's the clean water, the, the, where there's clean water left. Uh, as a matter of fact, just a few months ago, a uh, black family was down in Monroe, Michigan, which is down where a coal plant and a power plant is, uh, but a little bit south of there is one of the only kind of clean places where there's not deadly poison water with algae blooms and stuff like that. But anyway, they didn't like his music, man, and they killed him. They beat his head in with a lock and a chain. That's how settler colonialism is impacting people of color. In some places, they can't even go to the water. Uh, without it, you know, they, the, uh, 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 and before that, last summer, there was an Arabic family that were down there at one of those type of places. Actually, no, they were kind of up past this, out towards the Brighton Recreational uh, area, and uh, a couple of their teenagers had went out swimming with some of the local kids, you know, mostly white. It's also the home of the Ku Klux Klan in Michigan is up in that area, and uh, parents started wondering, well, where's my son, you know, and then the other's like, where's my son, and uh, uh, later on, they found one of them dead, drowned, or whatever it is, and the other one had went looking for him, or whatever it was, and just never found him. But all those white boys, I mean, you know, I'm just going to say it, they came back to their parents, they never said nothing about them parting ways from that other, uh, uh, from the other boys, or that that boy could be missing, or that he drowned in the area they were just freaking hanging out in, with no one else to see what happened. So, settler colonialism... Uh, has effed up our access to water as people of color, uh, especially in, in a lot of places. And I wanted to speak on that because we all know about the pollution aspect of it. You know, uh, we got Waffle Island right across from uh, right right across from us there in Windsor and Detroit. That's the First Nations there. That's unceded territory. That's like where some of the remnants of the old resistance still lives. I'm told. Uh, uh, and and they. Uh, Man, they, a lot of those folks up through there in Sarnia, they have this what they call a chemical valley. Man, they can't even go hunt. They can't go fish. Uh, nothing without uh, uh, literally uh, the, 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 the plants and animals in the water there are so polluted and that bad that you can't even have access to it and use it because you're literally killing yourself uh, by taking part of it. So that's a sim it, it's a similar thing. It's a, uh, uh, and the places where the water is still kind of pristine or clear and, and, and clean and stuff like that. Uh, they turned into resort areas, like you get up in uh, the Petoskey area there in Michigan, uh, uh, Odawa were pushed back into there, and that's like their little, that's, you know, some of them say that that's their, their, home, their home turf there, and that they were spread out into other places before the settlers came. And they were pushed back up into the far corners of that Michigan piece up to the coastal areas there. And then uh, I think it was like the 30s or the uh, whatever, uh, Whenever all the tribes were dissolved, I mean, I mean, when things were dissolved there in Michigan, I don't know how it went down in that part because I know how it went down for us in Oklahoma, but uh, uh, the lands were swapped. They, they, had, they were pushed back to the edges of the waters, and uh, 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 somehow or another, I think it was logging or something like that, like the lands were swapped. And so now it's all like rich resorts and different uh, business and industry, you know, that, that have control of the land, and people don't really have access to the water and to the land like that. Uh, the Odawa tribes uh, uh, are, are getting a lot of power back. You know, all of us are, you know what I mean? We're all getting it, you know, we're all getting it back. They thought they had us, but yeah, joke's on them, they didn't. Uh, uh, so, so a lot of us are getting our power back. And uh, so, so that's some examples of how settler colonialism and colonialism uh, uh, has impacted our access to waters as a uh, pollution. Uh, 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 the folks that came here now have all the lands and they don't want us there doing it. And if we do go there, we have to be fully assimilated, looking just like them, acting just like them, listening to their music, uh, walking, talking, drinking, thinking, speaking, everything just like them, or else you run a risk of being harmed. Your family runs a risk of being harmed. 
uh, potentially even death, you know. So that's that, that's uh, the different way settler colonialism and colonialism has impacted our accesses to water is uh, the waters uh, aren't always safe. And then the places that they are safe aren't always accessible. And sometimes when they are safe and accessible, the community that you're going in doesn't want you there. So yeah, that's what I've seen in my time. So we have uh, racism, sexism, colonialism. I would add resourcism. Resourcism is that same kind of idea of you know, we talk about money and everything, you know, and uh, it's deeper than money. It's the idea that things are, th that there are things. You know, our, our indigenous ways was that everything is alive and it had a spirit and it was, had its own reason for being here. But um, the wrongness of the culture that's eating up the world is because everything's a commodity. Everything is put into a form that can be bought, sold, has value, not only like, uh, an old movie, Little Big Man, is like even even their own people are dead. Even their own people are objectified. You saw that right in you know, slavery. You see that in what's going on and how people are valued as workers. Whatever it's it's things either have value. Your relationships, your friends, do you bring value to me? That kind of a thing. Instead of a relationship, a web of connection. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about also, I'm just responding to some of the things I heard was. Um, like several of our panelists have talked about, um, you hear responsibility and you hear right, and you hear responsibility and you hear right. So it's interesting in English, talking about colonialism, English is a colonial language, um, so it's hard, your, your thoughts shape language, but your language shapes your thoughts. Um, so it's hard to translate some things in some of our languages back and forth. Um, you think about the words responsibility, in English, right? You have to do something. It's you're supposed to do something. It's on you to do it. And then the right. A right is, well, it's my right to do this. And you know, whether it's a, a natural right or a natural law, or whether it's uh, given in the Constitution and other laws or whatever. So a right is, it's my right. Well, let's take look look at voting for politics, right? It's your right to vote, but is it your responsibility to vote? There, in, in, I worked in Hawaii, Office of Hawaiian Affairs, for a number of years. And there's a word, kuleana, which means both things. Because if you have a right, you have a responsibility. And if you have a responsibility, you have a right. They're not divided like they're in English. You know, if you have a piece of land that you take care of because it's part of your family's land or whatever, that's your responsibility. But you, it's your right to do it in the way you see fit to keep it going. And it's not like in our system where you're stuck with the responsibility but you don't have the right to do it a certain way or you have a right to do something but you're not responsible for it so that's that's a problem in English language um, I'll just leave that for with you to think about a little bit too thank you again to our panelists I have a question uh, with uh, great-grandmother Mary Lyons. I know that you have to go soon. Yes, <laughs> so I'm asking you, should we stop now at this time, you know? First of all, is, is, is it okay for us to, or? Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, as soon as I throw this mic, I'm gonna be over there eating. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's okay, everybody's really, hungry net there and I, and I hope you I think you all kind of got the feeling of what we're doing and stretching and I you know we, we have this we're not going to be giving you the answers hopefully we've implanted some some thoughts to move forward um, and start conversations so if we can invite the cook up to let us know what we're eating uh, can we call call oh he left well, what the heck? You get up here and tell us what's going on. No, I'm kidding. Okay, so uh, I, I, we're gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna eat. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm gonna go. With. So with with that, we'll conclude our panel uh, for uh, rights of water, and uh, then continue uh, commence with eating. Okay.
and let uh, the chef speak. 